Well, that's a quite a to- uh, topical question, actually, because um, Sergio yeah. AI is back again with another question here. Yeah. Um, is there anything Apple developers can do that will make integrating GraphQL easier? Because certainly in the past, we are not fearful, but reticent, you know, hesitant to uh, use technologies that Apple aren't like, explicitly endorsing, like, you know, almost built into Xcode and kind of endorsing. Yeah. And GraphQL currently is not one of those things. And so perhaps that's inhibiting us slightly. So what would make it easier for Apple developers to make integrating GraphQL easier? Um, I mean, honestly, I think a lot of the stuff that would make integrating GraphQL easier is stuff that applies much more broadly to code generation. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that, that makes this setup a lot more annoying is basically the absence of Xcode plugins. Um, you know, there, there's, there's, um, Xcode extensions, which have a very, very limited (laughs) amount that they can do. Um, you know, I, I, I used to, I, I wrote, uh, back in the day, I wrote an extension for, uh, for Xcode called Xcode Auto Basher, where you could basically say, okay, watch watch this directory or watch this file. Anytime it changes, regenerate, run this script. And um, so it was it was nice because I could use that to like automatically regenerate all of my model objects when I had changed uh, the core data model, or um, automatically regenerate this uh, file that had uh, type safe accesses to everything in my asset catalog. Whenever I put something new in the asset catalog or took something out of the asset catalog. And that's sort of something where like the fact that that's not super easy to do in iOS without having to do run script build phases and having to do some other weird nonsense. Um, that's really, that's really a huge thing that is annoying. I think from a standpoint of general GraphQL. Like one thing to remember is that this is ultimately something where you are sending a bunch of JSON to the server and the server is sending you a bunch of JSON back. And there's potentially other implementations where you could use other formats, but for right now, the overall majority of GraphQL implementations are using JSON. Mm. And I think it's it's something where if you can remember that, it, you know, ultimately that's what you're doing. Um, it's much more about sort of start trying to wrap your head around like, okay, like, you know, what are the places that I need to ask for what? And then particularly once you get into using a library, how is the caching working on this kind of thing? Cause like, it's, it's very different from sort of just being able to shove everything into a database the way that you can um, from a rest endpoint where you know exactly what you're getting back. You know, you can't say, okay, I'm going to make a user object that has the following, like, like it has a required ID, it's got a required username, it's got a, you know, required address. Well, the the ID can be required, but if you didn't ask for it, you're not going to get it. So you can you can just say, hey, I want user username, and that's the only thing it'll give you back. And so you can't just sort of shove that into a database that says, hey, your ID and your address are required. Because then the database is like, hey, these required objects aren't here. And so there's a lot of stuff around that that's really confusing for people. And like, I completely understand why. Like, there's, there's a lot of stuff about, our, uh, about how you have to work to cache that kind of thing that's extremely complicated. Um, but it's definitely something where starting with understanding sort of what's the idea here, what is the problem that we're trying to solve, and then going from there, I think, is, is a big thing. Um, does that make sense? It makes sense, yes.